Motion media has become a dominant form of communication, and in Chapter 6 we will look at the impact of this medium on society and the changes it has gone through, as well as where it's headed as far as the cinema, television, and technology. The first form of motion media was projected in the cinema. Movies became the lifeblood of images in motion and a favorite pastime of society. Movies are a very powerful vehicle for spreading messages, telling stories, and, and communicating a lot of information in a short window of time. The theater experience adds to the power of a film by blocking out all other communications and pulling the audience into the story. The book cites this phenomenon as, the, as a cocoon experience that helps the audience suspend disbelief or get drawn into the film and kind of swept away. The motion media industry can be broke down into broad and basic components. There's production, distribution, and exhibition. These components are still in place today. There are just many more avenues and new technologies that have altered and streamlined the process. Production has changed a lot since the beginning of films. Originally, it was a painstaking process of bits and pieces recorded over weeks and months that were assembled together in a chemical-based process, and there was physical editing of the film where it was actually cut. Television production more resembled theater as it was transmitted live to audiences, and of course, now with digital editing and recorded broadcasts, production has changed quite a bit over the years. Television's ability to directly distribute and exhibit motion media products was the biggest threat to the film industry when the two media formats were first competing for audiences. When television first arrived in people's homes in the 1950s, they were looked at by the movie industry as an enemy. Until television, Hollywood had a monopoly on the motion media game because the TV sets were so costly. Um, they became more and more common and began to steal the massive audiences away from theaters. The two forms of motion media began to join forces in an equally beneficial relationship that intertwined the force of each of the powerful mediums, and eventually they kind of subsumed each other um, with like Disney ABC, NBC Universal, and then in 20th Century Fox. So one of the first alliances that showed how a synergistic relationship could benefit both forms of motion media was the relationship between Disney and ABC. They used their popular movies to create television series and vice versa, and they were the first to figure out that they could maximize profits by adapting their product to different and new formats. So this type of synergy is still happening today with, you know, a plethora of devices coming out every day and everything's adapting to different different technologies and different media formats. So here are some movie products that are produced. Um, narrative or feature films, uh, they tell us a story. So this was one of the first formats that really drew in audiences and through the evolution of the format and changes in technology like camera capabilities and size, Directors started taking artistic liberties um, with the different formats and using the medium in new and experimental ways to tell a story. Directors started using close-ups and creative cutting. And at first, audiences kind of reacted adversely to the changes, but eventually people began to develop a literacy to film where artistic storytelling techniques were more and more understood, and now we're very literate about those different techniques. Through time, um, movies developed a distinctive format and common devices that help build an interesting story that are still used today. Talkies, of course, were the first films that where sound was added, and before this point, subtitles were standard in between scenes. William Dixon, who worked in Thomas Edison's laboratories, was the first to come up with a sound system for movies in 1889, but in the beginning they only used it on newsreels. Um, now, Warner Brothers used the technology in 1927 on a film called The Jazz Singer for two segments, uh, and the film was a huge success. And it was a huge revolution in the film industry, which spawned more and more experiments with audio and film. 
Color was another technological breakthrough in film that revolutionized the industry. In 1939, the film Gone with the Wind was the first box office smash, which was a talkie that had color. Another film had been done in color um, before this time called The Black Pirate in the 1920s, but the intricate narrative storyline and beautiful color on the movie Gone with the Wind made it stand out and it was very popular. So at that point, the bar in the film industry had been raised um, when Gone with the Wind came out. CGI or computer generated imagery um, began in the 70s with a movie called Future World and Star Wars, but the CGI explosion didn't begin until 1989. A company called Industrial Light and Magic who had worked in the industry for over a decade, blew moviegoers away with special effects on the Academy Award winning film, The Abyss. And popular films today are rarely ever created without at least a tiny bit of CGI in them. The rapid pace of technology and efficiencies for creating special effects on computers has brought us bigger and better effects, so these breakthroughs were propelled by audience reactions and profits. And each time a technique spawned a hit, it raised the bar and it has become the status quo. So every time something changes, then everybody starts using it to pull in viewers. Animation was an early art form marketed to the masses. In 1928, uh, Steamboat Willie debuted and defined a new genre. And Steamboat Willie is now known as Mickey Mouse and the Disney Company. Um, they came out with several animated features. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves came out in 1937 and helped animation really find its place in the narrative film genre. Animation's popularity was waning and it went through a resurgence in recent years. It used to take a thousand images per minute to animate a drawing. And now, um, with computer animation of course, this process has been really streamlined and improved uh, Toy Story was the first feature-length computer-animated film, came out in 1995, and since that time, um, we've had you know several computer-animated films per year, which gross billions and billions of dollars. Pixar, who's kind of the the boss of the, of this computer animation genre, was purchased by Disney for a whole bunch of money. The documentary is another product of the film industry that has underwent changes. Once um, they were very credible or seen as very credible, then um, with propaganda films during World War II, it began to chip away kind of at that trustworthiness that the audience felt for them. And then with the removal of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987, there was this rise in um, documentary films um, that have got the name Docugandas, and they've gained momentum. And Docugandas are persuasion documentaries. Um, their purpose is to inform and create opinions through a laundry list of techniques that might not always be ethical. Uh, Michael, Michael Moore is in this genre, and a high degree of media literacy is needed when viewing docugandas as they can present um, half-truths as whole truths. The Hollywood studio system was a streamlining process that created uh, an efficient system for pumping out movies. And Paramount Pictures is credited with kind of designing this system in the 1920s that produced our modern day Hollywood phenomena that we have. Production was made efficient by tight mass production schedules with programmed progress and eventually Paramount was producing a movie a week with this system. The writers, the actors, directors, editors, and technicians worked in a factory-like structure and they pumped out movie after movie after movie. The star system refers to the PR that was put in motion to turn actors into celebrities. The actors were strategically handled to create a frenzy around them, which resulted in bigger numbers at the box office um, for, for films. So this innovative studio system was used by all the major studios by 1930s. The studios controlled production, distribution, and the exhibition of films. And every aspect of this control over every part of the product in a system is known as vertical integration. And in the case of Paramount and other studios, this system lent itself to corruption and coercion and basically 
too much control over the product and too much control over the industry itself. So the Supreme Court stepped in, ruling that this was a monopoly. The ruling was labeled the Paramount decision, and it forced studios to break up some of this control. The studios had to give up their movie houses and compete in the market for screen time equally. And this was kind of what officially broke apart the Hollywood system. The studios had to create more quality movies instead of depending on quantity to fill the seats. So let's look at the six major studios. Um, we have Paramount, who had the studio system for a long time. So they were one of the first. And then Disney. Um, Disney went through quite a few different eras. Uh, the classic Disney under Walt's direction, which brought us the entire foundation for most of the Disney products that we know. Well, Walt Disney came to L.A. from Missouri with $40 in his pocket, so it's one of those rags-to-riches stories in the media, which is pretty common. And in 1923, he and his brother rounded up $500, and they created Steamboat Willie in 1928, who eventually became Mickey Mouse. Audiences loved the animations that they were making, and so they took a chance at a feature-length animation with Snow White in 1937, and it really, really paid off. And it was followed by Pinocchio and Dumbo and Bambi to great success. So in the 50s, other studios were struggling because of ticket sales were in decline due to television. Disney struck a deal with ABC in 1954 and produced a show called Disneyland. And they launched the Mickey Mouse Club. So in 1955, they built the first Disney theme park, which was in California, called Disneyland. And ever since then, that brand has really just been unstoppable. Walt Disney really understood the value of synergy in motion media and created the mold for most motion media companies for what they follow to this day. In 1984, Michael Eisner took over as CEO of Disney, and he followed Walt's blueprints and melded Disney with products outside of their genre, um, including edgy movies. They were produced under pseudo companies that were offshoots of the Disney brand, but Disney protected themselves from being tied to it um, by giving them different names. So like Dangerous Minds, Powder, a lot of movies were marketed under different movie company names like Touchstone, Caravan, Hollywood Pictures, and Miramax. And so that buffered the family-friendly reputation of Disney and still made them money. Eisner ran a successful company for 20 years, but he was ousted by shareholders after a long string of flops that followed in the shadow of The Lion King. After Eisner, Disney continued to lose their edge in the business that they knew best, animation, and this was due to the rise of Pixar. Uh, Disney was kind of looking like chop liver, so in a huge Landmark deal, they offered Steve Jobs $7.4 billion to purchase Pixar, and this deal at the time made Jobs the largest Disney shareholder and put him on the Disney board of directors, and Pixar still pumps out hits every year. Columbia was founded in 1919 and has been owned by Coke and Sony, among other high-profile companies. They produce movies under the name TriStar, Columbia, Phoenix, and Mandalay. Columbia also produces television shows like Jeopardy. 20th Century Fox formed in 1915 and is now a part of Rupert Murdoch's Global Empire News Corporation. And then we have Universal, um, which was part of General Electric, who purchased them in 2002. So Universal became part of the NBC family, who is also owned by GE. And GE then sold the company to Comcast, and the companies have created this synergistic content and mutually benefited each other um, th throughout this process. Warner Brothers was founded in 1918 and became part of Time Inc. in 1989. The company became Time Warner and produces movies under the name Castle Rock, New Line, and Lorimar. So the big six are these giant synergistic entities that produce a lot of motion media content under a lot of different names. Independence came about in a similar way as indie labels in the recording industry. The big players in the film industry wanted to break away from the Hollywood system to create under an auto autonomous system that they could control and express their artistic visions without interference from the bigs. So. 
not all of them began this way. There's also the rags to rich, riches stories that are common in most types of media. And then there's some independents that depend on the big six for financing. So through the years, most of the independents have been subsumed into the majors, with the exception of United Artists, which had a really long run of viability. United Artists was created by Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, D.W. Griffith, and Mary Pickford, who were tired of the profit-obsessed industry of making movies, and they founded United Artists in 1919, and they created a number of movies that did really well with the critics and gave them uh, complete creative control over the content, or the directors had creative control over the content. They ended up one of the only independents who had long-term success in Hollywood, but they began to falter in 1980, and then they were purchased by an insurance company when they lost viability and profitability, and then sold to MGM later on. They made a film called uh, Heaven's Gate, and they spent a whole bunch of money on it, and it flopped when it got to the theater, and it sunk them. DreamWorks was created by media giants David Geffen, Steven Spielberg and Jeff Katzenberg in 1994. They produced a string of really, really successful movies like Saving Private Ryan and Gladiator, um, to name a few, but they sold out to Paramount in 2005 for $1.6 billion. And then Miramax was started by the Weinstein brothers, Bob and Harvey, in 1979. And this was a rags-to-riches story for the big independents. They were concert promoters from New York who devised a plan to move to L.A., buy low-budget independent films for cheap, and market them in a huge way. And they produced a lot of gems with this system, including Sex, Lies, and Videotape and Pulp Fiction, which launched Quentin Tarantino's career, uh, Good Will Hunting, the Scary Movie franchise, among others, uh, Miramax was eventually subsumed by the Disney brand. Lionsgate was founded in 1997, and they work under a different system. They release only about 20 movies a year, but usually, like, three-fourths of them are hits. So they have this high ratio of successful movies, and they also purchase rights for older popular movies and remarket them through domestic and overseas venues, which can be very profitable. Little movies have gained momentum in recent years through public demand. Film festivals like Sundance and Cannes uh, help the independent movie companies get their, get their content out there, and it, they have worked as a springboard for many unknowns, like Quentin Tarantino was a product of the system. Uh, Low-budget movies are found at these festivals and, and in different places, and then distributed to a wider audience by larger companies. And film festivals are just a place where big movie companies come and they look at low-budget works and they try to figure out which ones will make them a profit. And they choose some to distribute, and it works out nicely for everyone because the filmmaker usually makes a profit, and the film company has half of their work done for them by buying a completed film. Exhibition niches, like art house theaters, help smaller movies gain momentum, usually in cities or college towns. Art house theaters, uh, they cater to a sophisticated crowd through their small venues, and they focus on films outside of the Hollywood system, like foreign films, documentaries, and tour films, and other types of specialty films. They don't have to go through the box office frenzy like the biggies do. And it's become a popular trend for multiplexes to book one screen for niche movies uh, because they can be really profitable. Little Miss Sunshine, March the Penguins, and An Inconvenient Truth made their way through this system and were all very, very successful. Gearing films towards a demographic niche based on race, education, or age is usually profitable. But more success is found in movies that have a really broad appeal. So while focusing in on a demographic like a teen flick will usually produce solid returns, it will probably not be a box office smash hit like a film with a broader audience like, say, Titanic. Foreign films have picked up momentum as investors have seen the potential for profit from movies like Amelie and Life is Beautiful. They both raked in a lot of dough. So more and more producers are looking at them as serious contenders for box office profits. 
So even though independent film companies normally topple in the Hollywood market, independent filmmakers have been able to find venues to sell their films to larger companies, and this has resulted in a lot of smaller movies finding a successful place among the biggies, and sometimes making more profits because of the lower budgets used to create the work. And then we also have the influence of the internet, where um, there's a lot of niche audience members um, out there to be marketed to through that long tail of the media sales online. In 1946, movie ticket sales were at 90 million a week. This was the peak right before television hit the home front. Box office revenue has been struggling ever since that time and has never again had a heyday like it. Many attempts have been made to boost ticket sales through the years, including theater remodels, um, enforcing rules of audience members like telephone, shut your phone off, that kind of thing, um, in an attempt to make the movie more enjoyable for everyone, and new technologies. The success of a film in the theater is a good indication of how profitable a film will be. We often hear announcements for the box office smash or the largest grossing movie at the box office. Before there were movie houses, Store owners and other entrepreneurs would put up a white sheet in their storefront or put up a circus tent with a whitewashed piece of plywood and charge admission to watch projected films. During the attendance peak in the 1940s, movie houses spread across the country and they popped up in small neighborhoods and cities. Drive-ins became commonplace and people went to movies two or three times a week sometimes. Then came network television and many movie houses closed down, and a lot of them never reopened. Beginning in the 1970s, theaters, mostly chains, began revamping. They followed the customers to the suburbs, and the multiplex was born. And the multiplex is the standard theater format now. There's several screens showing separate movies, um, and it's a better way to keep audiences purchasing tickets. So while one film might do poorly, another one might do well and t a lot of tickets will be sold. So while box office sales are a really good measurement for the profitability of a movie, so is the amount of screens that the film will be shown on. Movie houses have theaters of different sizes that will accommodate the needs of different customer demands by booking popular movies in a larger venue or even showing it on more than one screen. Multiplexes have bumped up ticket sales, but nothing has ever come close to the 1946 pre-television boom. Here are some new new ideas in cinema. Um, D-Cinema is the latest alternative to try and cut costs in movie theaters, except the equipment to do this costs $100,000 per theater. Um, 3D has had a resurgence to draw in audiences, but now television is filling that niche as well. And D-Cinema is just a it's digital theater projection, which is crisper and clearer. It's not HD, but it's pretty close, and the reels don't have to be shipped anymore, but most of the distribution companies will put films on both formats because not all theaters have been able to afford that huge price tag for D-Cinema. In 2006, the entire movie industry began to make a switch to set in motion a 10-year project to switch all movies, uh, all movie houses to digital projection. In 2009, AMC struck a landmark deal with Sony to replace all of the projectors in all of their theaters. And the estimated savings of D-Cinema in transportation and handling is $568 million a year. Movies are converging with digital media in a big way and making the natural leap to streaming right to our televisions and computers since that's where the audiences are at. In the 1950s, when television came on the scene, it put a lot of pressure on all other mass media industries to reinvent themselves. It was a threat that turned into a healthy competition. It melded with the movie industry and made radio and magazines step up and create better and more interesting content. And those who didn't rise to the challenge disappeared. Television was the king for a long, long time. And now, with all the technological advances, TV is having to step up and converge with the internet in order to stay viable. While it's still pretty strong and it's not going to disappear 
anytime soon. It is in crisis. Almost every home in the United States has at least one TV set, which is on about seven hours a day, and people still plan their schedules and view some shows at their designated times, but it's happening less and less in the age of DVR and TiVo and Hulu and all of these um, watch-on-demand applications. Television still helps shape culture by pumping out new celebrities and covering politicians and news and runs huge advertising campaigns, but advertisers are moving their dollars to other venues in heaps, and that is one of the things that kills media that is subsidized by advertising. Television homogenized culture and helped fragment us into subcultures. It has impacted opinions of people's roles in society by showing non-traditional characters succeeding in a variety of roles. From the 1950s Perfect Housewife to Mary Tyler Moore succeeding in a male-dominated industry, television has taught us what to expect from the world. And much like our education system, we are schooled in television from a small child, and it's helped form how we think as a society. The regulatory sanctions of the Federal Radio Act changed the way that radio worked in 1927 through a licensing system. And then when TV started, the system was revamped to cover a broader range of regulation. The Federal Communications Act was created in 1934, and in 1939, David Sarnoff attempted to launch the first network, uh, NBC, at the World's Fair, and this launch was impeded by World War II. The FCC would not license any stations during that time um, for national security, but Sarnoff finally got his chance about two years later in 1941. By 1948, coaxial cables were ran to the Midwest and carried TV signals to local transmission towers. And by 1951, the country was wired from New York to LA. Local stations dominated then, but were fed programming from the big three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. 200 local affiliates and television stations became a two-tier system. There were locally licensed affiliates and national networks that fed into them. The networks were very competitive and each had their claim to audiences like ABC which with late night and early morning talk shows, CBS with The Twilight Zone and I Love Lucy, and popular investigative news programs like one called See It Now, and ABC with their Disney Connection which included Disneyland and Mickey Mouse Club and later Monday Night Football, and ABC's Wide World of Sports. In 1986, Rupert Murdoch joined the Big Three with Fox and turned it into the Big Four. He competed by running popular low-budget shows like Married with Children and found a lot of success with the Simpsons series. And Fox also outbid CBS to televise half of the Sunday National Football Games in 1994, which helped the station sustain their place among the other three giants. In the beginning, cable just extended local programming to people beyond the network's reach. People in mountainous and remote regions were wired to get signals from nearby cities. And this new audience made networks and station owners happy because they got broader audience with no investment. And it brought in advertisers and the people were happy to get TV signals. This was known as CATV, or Community Antenna Television. In the 1970s, this cable system began to change. Gerald Levine of Time Incorporated saw the potential in cable and began HBO, or Home Box Office, which was a subscription channel that was delivered by satellite that had specialty programming. It wasn't a big hit at first, but viewership grew as cable channels were added. Ted Turner created WTBS, CNN, Headline News, and TNT, news and movie stations that were not regulated by the government FCC regulations, and they began to gain momentum, adding ESPN, MTV, home shopping. Um, and then by 2008, there were 330 national cable networks. Wall Street investors took notice of the growth and helped the industry along by investing in it, which resulted in hundreds of acquisitions and mergers. Uh, the companies came together and formed multi-system networks, which ran many channels out of a single company. Comcast is the largest of these multi-systems, and 90% of U.S. households have cable today. 
Disney, Viacom, NBC Universal, News Corporation, and Time Warner own most of the channels that we have. Satellite is an expensive industry to get into, and so there are a few companies which deliver satellite content. Um, DirecTV and Dish Network are the two in the United States. Their direct delivery requires no cables and has been increasingly stealing customers from regular cable networks, of which there are many. Video on demand, or VOD, this is what the trend is now. Um, VOD is just people watch when they want. Time-shifting capabilities like DVR and TiVo have been really hard on advertisers because now we can fast-forward through commercials and it's caused a decrease in revenue for TV stations as they migrate over to other venues like the internet. Television advertising is still a multi-billion dollar business with giants like AT&T and Procter and & Gamble still relying on it for their main advertising source. Portable devices are anytime, anywhere viewing of on-demand programming. Sites like Hulu and even you know Netflix, whatever, and sometimes even Websites created by the networks themselves have made it possible to watch archived shows on almost any device. This video on demand revolution has just begun and it will likely transform the motion media world in the years to come. And now, of course, we have like Gamefly, which is shifting our gaming capabilities at home. So, public television is basically the same story as public radio. Um, the Carnegie Commission asked Congress for an alternative government-funded educational platform to counter the vast wasteland of network television in the 1960s, and Congress responded by funding the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And then by the late 60s, there, there were 300 educational channels that had mm -hmm. limited audiences, and they were mostly recordings of boring lectures with little entertainment value. As content increased in quality, so did viewership and funding from viewers during fund drives. PBS and other publicly funded stations have grown into powerhouses with huge, broad audiences, and so there's been questions arising of whether government funding is needed anymore. Also, some viewership has been siphoned off by cable networks like National Geographic, Discovery, the History Channel, who began running programming that was once exclusively on PBS. So that's all I have for you on Motion Media Chapter 6. See you in class.